The ADR-V9001 transceiver product family comes as standard with the transceiver evaluation software and software development kit free of charge to all customers. These software tools provide users with powerful evaluation and development capabilities, leading to fast end product development cycles. In this video guide, we'll take a look at downloading both tools from analog.com and installing them in a scalable and easy to use way. Once complete, we'll verify that the installations have worked as expected. I'm Ushin Watkins, and you're very welcome to this video guide from Analog Devices. We'll begin by inspecting the written quick start guide on the Engineer Zone forum for this product family. This video guide will hit all the same key points as the written guide, so if you haven't read the guide yet, I do recommend you go and take a look. For this video, we'll start by following the link provided for you here. This link takes you to our own wideband RF transceiver software page. There are a lot of software packages provided here for a wide range of transceiver products. However, our focus will be on the ADR-V9002, 9003 and 9004 products listed in the table here. The table has two options listed, the software development kit and the SD card imaging software. The SD card imaging software is provided as part of the software development kit, so there is no need to download this zip file today. Instead, we'll just download the software development kit. Once downloaded, you will see the zip file in your downloads folder. Let's extract this into a dedicated folder and then decide on where to keep it. The resulting folder is simply titled ADRV9001-SDK. This houses all of our software and our license agreements. Strictly speaking, this folder can be kept anywhere. However, for ease of use and to allow scalability, we recommend that it be kept under C, Program Files x86, Analog Devices. Personally, I also recommend storing each revision of the SDK separately under folders titled V0.14 or V0.15 or whatever version number you happen to have downloaded. So now let's move the SDK into its appropriate folder. Now that the SDK is in its more permanent home, let's explore the contents a little bit. The license folder is little more than a PDF containing our software license agreement. You will be asked to agree to this during the TES installation process, but more on that later. All of the software we're interested in is stored under the PKG folder. Here we see three subfolders and a collection of .md files. Two of these .md files should be paid close attention, namely the changelog and the readme files. As these software packages are revised and updated, all notes about the updates will be kept here. For the sake of keeping your own development platform up to date, we strongly recommend you keep up to date with these files. Otherwise, the two folders of primary interest are the evaluation and the production folders. The production folder houses a C99 based platform, which customers can use to begin development of their own unique platform. However, at this stage, there is no need to dive any further into this subfolder. For the TES installation, we need to navigate under the Evaluation folder. Here is housed the executable installers for both our transceiver evaluation software and our SD card imaging tool. We can now run both of these installers either as an administrator or with elevated privileges. As I stated earlier, I like to version my software installations, so here I will be installing these TES package under the same v0.1x folder I made earlier. Both of these installations will require you to download the Microsoft.NET framework as part of their installations. Once complete, you should now see both software packages installed under the directories you provided. Let's focus on the TES package for now. Under the ADR v9001 TES folder, we'll see this long list of folders, DLLs and debug files. The TES executable file is here, listed as argo.navis.exe. Simply run this executable. Admin privileges are not needed. Once it's ready, you'll be presented with our GUI, as you can see on screen now. 
you'll initially be presented with this page showing connection information. Given that the platform is not yet connected, this page is understandably blank. The Xilinx ZC706 platform that the TES connects to defaults its IP address to 192.168.1.10 with a default gateway of 5557. However, if the platform is connected to a router, the IP address will be assigned dynamically at platform bootup. If this is your preferred method of using the platform, you will have to find the IP address of the platform after the device is powered up and enter it here. At this point, I'm going to power up the evaluation setup I have on my desk. On the ADR-V9002 daughter card I'm using, I have the TX1 output connected to a spectrum analyzer and a signal generator connected to the RX1A input, as you can see in this block diagram. We'll be using these external tools to verify the operation of the device. Once connected, you'll see this table with device information printed onto the screen. To give a quick rundown on the contents, you'll note that I'm using C0 silicon with the W1 variant of the evaluation board, which denotes the lower frequency variant. There's also a list of device driver information here. As not every device driver is compatible with every SD card image release or every TES release, it's important to be certain that all versions listed here are compatible with each other. Information on this can be found in the change logs and readmes I highlighted earlier. Now that we've connected to the device, the next step is to configure the setup, which can be done through the configurations tab. Here we will handle the underlying setup of the device, for example LTE, DMR, analog FM, etc. Here we also set the duplexing standard we need to use, TDD, FDD, TDM FDD, in custom setups we can also choose to use kilohertz or megahertz as our preferred units. At any point during the setup, these traffic lights on the right hand side will indicate if the current setup is legal for the device. If you're designing your own custom setup, don't be too deterred by this. It may turn red for some time until the very last bit of your setup is written into this tab, at which point it will recognize the legality of your setup. The remainder of the configurations tab is used to set up the running conditions for the RX and TX signal chains at a very high level. You'll note here we can set the synchronous serial interface settings, the signal chain data type, sample rate and RF port. For this example we'll run an LTE setup in TDD mode using only RF channel 1, i.e. RX1 and TX1. We'll also set the signal chain sample rate to 15.36 megasamples per second. There are several tabs available here for you to customize based on your own application. For this beginner guide, we'll ignore most of them and just quickly look at this carriers tab. Near the top of the tab is a drop down menu allowing users to select either the defined carrier frequencies or the frequency hopping modes of operation. We will be leaving this tab in its default configuration, defined carrier frequencies with both the RX and TX carriers set to 900 MHz. At this point, if we're satisfied with the device setup, we can press the program button at the top menu and wait for the device to program. It's essential that no RF signal be present on the RX port or be able to be transmitted from the TX port before pressing the program button. This is to ensure successful calibration of the part and prevent any unregulated transmissions from the part. Once the device is successfully programmed, we can move over to the TX tab. As we're only using the TX1 signal chain, we'll focus on those settings. The TX1 attenuation is currently set to 10 dB. This should be acceptable for us. We need to change the data source option to single tone and then calibrate the tone as we need. By default, the single tone will be set to a plus 3 MHz offset from the carrier at minus 1 dBFS. This should suit us fine. Pressing the play button, we see the time and frequency domain plots appear in TES. Switching over to the spectrum analyzer connected to TX1, we can confirm that the signal is present at 903 MHz at roughly the right power level. I have not measured the loss for this particular cable, so I cannot account for that, but we're close enough to the right level here that this is acceptable. Returning now to TES, let's turn off the TX and shift our focus to RX. The RX tab has fewer options to configure. The main one is the RX gain table index. We're going to leave everything at their default values and just press play. At first, as we expect, we see the noise floor with a slight dip at the cutoff frequency of the channel filter. If I now inject an 897 MHz tone at minus 10 dBm into the RX1A port, we should see the tone appearing in TES. 
Note the level of the signal is around the minus 10 dBFS point, at a minus 3 MHz offset from the carrier. This is all operating as we expect. Now I will disable my signal generator, and press the stop button. At this point, we've successfully downloaded, installed, and verified the operation of the TEZ package. We can now shut down the platform and exit TEZ. After roughly 15 or 20 seconds, it should be safe to switch off the power for the platform. Thank you all for watching this video tutorial. I hope it helped you get set up with your own evaluation platform. There will be more video guides to come. Keep an eye out on whichever platform you viewed this video on for the next one. If you have any questions in the meantime, you should be able to find our dedicated support forums for this product family over on Engineer Zone. The links should be in the description of this video, but if you can't find them, navigate to our product page on analog.com and you should be able to see the links to our forums posted there. Thank you all once again, and I'll see you in the next one.